So, hello everyone and welcome, especially those of you that have been forced to stay here all day to come to the, to the talk. Um, we are going to, to have a, I'm sure it's a very nice talk that Bill is going to tell us about the, their experience with UAV vehicles. So um, if you need to ask any question after a talk, just press the button because the talk is being recorded. And if you don't speak through a microphone, it will not be recorded, so, okay. Um, I'm actually not going to introduce Bill because all of you will have been spending a week with him, so you will know who he is. And is it on? Ah. And Ed, I can tell you later who he is, so we're going to start with the talk. Okay, thank you. So this is an experiment to study the marginal ice zone. Before I tell you about it, I have to tell you about an instrument that was built for me by Ball Aerospace. I was really lucky, one of my former students, she was working at Ball Aerospace, and she got some money from the company. It's called IRAD. It's their investment in research and development. And she said, well, if you built a radiometer, an infrared radiometer for a UAV, what would, you, what would it look like? What would you require? So <clears throat> I talked to her about that, and I told her what I would do and how I would do it. Now, there have been a lot of radiometers. You can buy an infrared radiometer that looks like this. You know, they're really small and they're very high resolution, but they're not calibrated. They're all, you know, they, they measure an infrared pattern, but you don't know what the temperatures are. And infrared has a bad habit of drifting. Infrared is not very stable over time. So it's really important that you have infrared instruments that are calibrated. Now the big breakthrough that made these instruments possible, it used to be if you had an infrared detector array, they were very large and expensive and you had to cool them. You had to use some kind of cooling system. Well, they have now developed a thing called a microbolometer. So this microbolometer here, a bolometer is something that measures infrared directly, so it's actually responding to the temperature. So bolometers were actually good. They were good measurement systems for temperature, but they were big and they were heavy. And so you never put them in space because they were too heavy. But now we have microbolometers. They're small, they're very compact, they're very responsive, very sensitive, and they got to be over the period of developing this instrument cheap. When Michelle started this program, the microbolometer that we were designing to cost $15,000. When we finished, it cost $800. So <clears throat> it's a lot. And now they're making a lot more, and they're making them in the same form, in the same format, so we can put more on. These microbolometers do not require cooling. They do not have to be cooled to maintain their sensitivity. And that's a huge, big difference. So since all infrared units drift, if you really want to have temperature and not just a pattern, if you really want to have actual temperature, you have to have a way of calibrating it. And if you're going to calibrate a temperature, you need two points. You have to have two points to draw a line, right? So you have to have two points. And the way you do this is with two black bodies. And the black bodies have to be separated by a temperature. So what we did was we installed two black bodies, one heated and one floating with the temperature of the instrument. This is the instrument in an exploded view. It's very modular. So you can trade out any of the components. 
This instrument, this is the instrument, and so it can look down, which is the target, and it can look up. Why do you want to look up? Well, the sky gives off infrared radiation as well. That infrared radiation will go down and hit the surface. So let's say we're looking at the ocean. It will hit the sea surface, and it will bounce back into your radiometer. You don't want that. So you have to have a way of measuring the sky infrared radiation. And we want to use the same microbolometer. So we have a mirror in here that oscillates. And what are these two other things? These are the black bodies. So we have one black body that floats with the temperature of the instrument. And we have another black body that is heated 12 degrees above the other black body. That's an interesting situation because I'm now trying to create a version of this radiometer, but I want to measure lava. And lava is at 1,100 degrees Kelvin. So this doesn't work anymore. You don't want to go, because your instrument's now going to be quite a bit warmer, and you don't want to heat it 12 more degrees. So we now are looking at installing a cooling system. So we can cool one down and leave the other one at ambient. So this is what it looks like. It's pretty small, just about so big. I'll show you the weight. So these are the black bodies, and they're covered with foil to insulate them. And uh, this, is, this is the microbolometer, and this is the motor in here that turns this mirror. So it measures, and it measures a two-dimensional two grid. And then every <clears throat> so many seconds, the mirror rotates, does the black body, does the up, does the other black body, and then comes back to the target. So this fold mirror rotates to sample the target, 2D array, the black bodies in the sky. One black body is heated up 12 degrees warmer. So, <clears throat> and then we also measure the infrared sky radiation. The sequence is automated by a mini PC, which is not included in here. And it's interesting, we have somebody that is getting some money out of the Department of Energy for us to redesign this instrument with the computer built in. So we would like to have an instrument that was just plug, you just plug in. This one, you still have to have a miniature PC to go with it. So it collects the data over the region of interest. For this data collection, the frame rate is 3 hertz. So there's a delay of 33, 333 milliseconds between the frames, and the PC computer makes this overall frame rate slightly less than 3 hertz. So you collect a total of 130 frames of data, and then it takes about 53 seconds, and then there's a calibration cycle of only seven seconds. So for seven seconds, you miss the data. So you're going to have to interpolate. We talked about interpolation, right? You're going to have to do that. But it's only seven seconds. And during that seven seconds, you collected both of the black bodies and the sky radiation. OK. <clears throat> All right. So. Time, it turns out to be very important. So what do we do to keep track of time? We install a GPS. So there's a GPS in this, but we don't use it for location. In the future, maybe we will, because that turns out to be a real problem. But we use it now just for a timestamp. Tells us exactly what time. GPS clocks are very good, and so we get GPS time. So this is a picture of the orientation with the optical path. This is the detector, the microbolometer. This is the motor that turns the mirror <coughs> to look at the different targets. And this is the mass summary. So you can see how big it is. The biggest element, of course, is the motor. That's the heaviest part. Oh, there's my water. So that that's the motor, but 
Altogether, this thing only weighs 1.36 kilograms. So it doesn't weigh very much. And that's good because the kind of UAV we're going to look at doesn't carry that much. So it's very important to have it very modestly <coughs> sized. Now we have to add the, the computer and stuff which adds almost another kilogram. So these are the black bodies. So these are kind of a critical factor in here. These were actually designed and built by Ball Aerospace. So building black bodies is, is kind of interesting. I, when I teach <coughs> um, my remote sensing class, I, I ask the students how they would build a black body. And I get some really interesting ideas. The important thing about black bodies is trapping the radiation. And it turns out that cones are the best thing. So this is kind of, when you build a really small one, you can't afford a large cone. And I'll show you a picture of us calibrating this against a reference black body, which has a large cone. But then you want to control the temperature of the cone. The cones are generally made out of brass, a metal, which can be machined very nicely. And then they're painted black inside with a very special black paint. And if you go to a calibration conference, like they have one in Utah every year, you can go to a whole session on black paint. They talk, the whole session is about black paint. So these are also painted black, but they're made much smaller, but this is the angle that traps the radiation. So we have two of these small black bodies. And this is really the key element to getting the absolute temperature. So here, are, this is the electronic system, okay? And so there's a computer that drives it, also records the data, and this is the radiometer. You have to have a motor supply, a heater supply, and the instrument is covered with thermistors. So we monitor the thermistors that measure the temperature of the instrument. We measure the temperatures of the black body. So we keep track of all of the temperatures. And that's embedded in the data stream. Because we have to know how the temperature, the, th the temperature of the instrument is behaving. So when we built this thing, I knew a lot of people were going to be very skeptical about how good this little tiny radiometer could be. So I proposed that we go to the University of Miami where they have a big black body. This is a black body. The way they control the temperature of the black body, it's a water bath. So there's water in it. And the water is stirred and heated so they can control the temperature and you can get a very uniform temperature. And their black body has been compared with what we call NIST. NIST now stands for the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And these are the people whose job it is to maintain the standards. So NIST, they will come and do a comparison with their black bodies. They will charge you money. But Miami did that. So this is a NIST traceable black body. So we went down, and this guy right here, he's now my graduate student. He wasn't then, he was a technician at Ball, but now he's a graduate student. So you can see our little tiny radiometer over here, and we're looking at the black body. So we're now measuring the temperature with our radiometer, with its little black bodies, against this black body, which we can now can control the temperature, and this is the curve. So it's very linear. The system is responding extremely well. Now we had a problem at Miami. Miami is very warm, like here. Very humid, like here. So you could not go down to cold temperatures. All you got was if you went down to cold temperatures, there was water everywhere. 
So we couldn't do that. So Ball actually had another black body that they brought, which had never been, which was not nistraceable, and so they calibrated it against their, this black body. And we would go back to Colorado, where we don't have any moisture in the air, and they could make cold measurements. But this is the arrangement for calibrating this instrument. That was the first thing we did. And then we calculated some, ex we made extra measurements of the behavior of our instrument. And you can see, except for this one point, which goes slightly above 0.15, all of these are within 0.1. Now, 0.1 is the precision of the microbolometer. So it can't really do better than that. That's the limit. But you can see it, it really performing very well. So like I said, we had this problem with, <coughs> with Miami. And so to do lower temperatures to get down into this low range, we went back to Colorado and we used the ball now the ball calibrated black body to, <coughs> re, to calibrate the low temperatures. And, and this instrument, this instrument is called BEST. Why is it called BEST? Well, when Michelle was building it, she called it the Bill Emery SST radiometer. And I didn't like that. It didn't seem right to have my name associated with the instrument. So I call it the Ball Experimental. SST radiometer. So that's its name, Ball Experiment. And I wrote the paper, so I got to call it whatever I wanted. <laughs> so after they did this calibration, after they realized the right, the absolute calibration curve, we, we then went out on a pier next to the University of Miami and looked at the water. And so you can see this is their interferometer, huge. It weighs 500 kilograms. It takes a crane to put it on a ship. It takes two people to operate it. it costs $500,000. It's a really neat piece of equipment, at least you'd think so. These are their two black bodies right here. They're quite big. This is our little teeny instrument right here. <laughs> so we're on top of it, and we're trying to look at the same patch of water. And in this region right by the pier, the water was pretty well stirred. Now, we wanted to measure for six hours, but a storm came in. So we only had two hours of measurements, unfortunately. Would have been nice. This is the marine atmosphere emitted radiation interferometer. So it's large and expensive. But Miami has multiple of those, and they put them on ships and made a lot of measurements. But there are some limitations. So the view angle is 55 degrees. Does anybody know why you would use 55 degrees? Has anybody ever heard of the Brewster's angle? Okay, Bruce's angle is the angle when you're supposed to get the minimal reflection. You should get the maximum emitted radiation from the surface is the Brewster's angle. And the Brewster's angle, usually about 53, but 55 is what, what we used here. So <clears throat> the Mary was approximately two meters and then we were approximately half a meter above that. So this is the plot that we published. So you can see at the beginning of these two hours, well, both instruments were pretty wild. So they're settling down. But you can see the difference. The but the Mary, the way that the thing was programmed, would only spit out a value every 10 minutes. <laughs> I don't know why you have this kind of an instrument and you get data every 10 minutes. 
the best was putting out measurements every few seconds. So that's why you see lots and lots of points. So this is the best variability, and these are the points that I agreed with the people in Miami to publish. The original data looked like this, okay, and, and there was a gap in here that we, we actually had measurements, but we had to put them in later. But you can see how wild the Mary was. So Peter Minette at Miami was very embarrassed, and so I agreed that we would only publish these. Looks much better, you, you know. You, if you have a half million dollar instrument, it's doing such lousy measurements. So um, <clears throat> we didn't publish that plot. Interestingly enough, both instruments measured the same mean temperature over the two hours. The mean came out to be exactly the same, 30.18. Both instruments included a sky correction, so the Mary has a sky correction as well. And <clears throat> so we ended up neglecting the first hour of measurements, and we only included the last hour of measurements. So over the last hour of measurements, the Mary gave a mean of 30.04, where we had 30.01, which is pretty close. The problem is the standard deviation. The Mary standard deviation was 0.54, which is quite large. And the best was 0.14, which is very good. So this little dinky radiometer that's the first one we built cost about 60000 The second one we built cost about 40000 We think we could make them if we made a lot of them probably at twenty, twenty-five, thirty thousand, 30000 something like that. A lot cheaper than this $500,000 thing. Okay, so um, you could see that the Mary variability, that was caused by this point. Primarily, I don't I don't know what was wrong. I mean, even best had a slight deviation there, but not not certainly as bad as as the Mary. So taken over the entire time series, the standard deviation for the best was only 0.14, which includes the transition, transient startup period. So if you threw that away, it would be even better. So it's very consistent with the 0.1 calibration or precision of the microbolometer. So the first time we flew this best um, was not on a UAV. The people at at Ball had an agreement with the company in Grand Junction, Colorado, which is on the <coughs> uh, western slopes, so other side of the mountains. And they flew a thing called the Twin Otter. Has anybody heard of a Twin Otter? It's a very common aircraft to be used. It's a turboprop. It's extremely stable. So we went out on, on a Twin Otter. Um, the worst part of the journey was the nine-hour flight from Colorado to Mississippi. That was horrible. <laughs> and, and back, we had to come back. Actually, on the way down, we ran into thunderstorms, and we had to actually overnight in New Mexico. And, and I had no idea that you can fly across the country in the U.S. in an airplane like this, and you can land on an airfield without anybody supervising and you drive up to the gas pump and you put in your credit card and you fill up your tank and you take off. So it's just like a car. We did that lots of times. So when we got down to Mississippi, we were flying out of <coughs> a small airfield over here. This was the Deep Horizon oil spill. Everybody's heard of the Deep Horizon oil spill. 
So this was a huge, huge phenomenon. This is a plot taken from satellite data. And this yellow stripe is where we flew over. And unfortunately, on, this com on the computer that I brought, I'm missing all of the photos that I took. So we had lots of pictures of the ships and, and oil and all that stuff. But we flew over, and this area right in here is kind of where the oil really was. And so this was a strip that the best collected. Now, in this configuration, we didn't have any sky correction because of the top of the airplane. So we just had simply the water, but we did have the black bodies. And if you look at this strip, turns out that oil, during the day, this was a daylight image, the oil heats up more than the water. At night, the oil actually cools faster than the water. So you get another difference, but this was a daytime image. So you can see the oil patches in the water. Okay, and, and so <clears throat> this is actually a calibrated temperature. It can give you the temperature of the features. Another flight, and I wasn't on this one, I was on the other one, but I wasn't on this one. They flew this instrument over the Great Salt Lake, which is pretty close to us. And so <clears throat> this is a comparison between a MODIS satellite pixel. That's one kilometer. So that's, you can see sort of the edges of the pixel here, here. Pixel is one kilometer in size. This is the best through here. Now, you know, when, when we were flying in the Twin Otter, we were flying about um, 900 feet, so about, about 300 meters. And when we end up flying in the UAV, as I'll show you, we're flying only at about 500 feet, so like 120 meters. So the, the pixels inside of this stripe are, um, well, in the UAV, they're about one meter, and, and here they're probably about three meters. The pixel here is one kilometer. So we're comparing a one kilometer thing with stuff that's one to three meters. So I, I still want, and I've proposed it many times and have yet to get it funded, I want to go out and measure a complete, a, a complete pixel or a number of complete pixels many times with the UAV because I'm convinced that one of the main reasons that temperature from the satellite does not agree with coincident skin measurements from things like the MARI is because of spatial variability. I think there's so much spatial variability and it's very transient and changes very quickly that you will never get a good correspondence with MARI because it's only taking like three points across a one kilometer pixel. It's not going to happen. It can't see the spatial variability, but I can see it. I can see it on a one to three meter scale. And I can tell you, I want to tell you what a pixel looks like. I want to be able to say, look, your one kilometer pixel looks like this. And so this is the reason your individual infrared points don't agree with the pixel, because the pixel is averaged over all of this stuff. Sandra Castro, one that I keep telling Rena about, she's from Columbia. She's, <coughs> she's my former graduate student, and she married Gary Wick, also my former graduate student. But she wrote a very careful paper. She's a very careful person, unlike myself. Um, <coughs> she, she wrote a really good paper where she compared all of the available skin temperature measurements from ships, Mary, a thing called the serums that Andy Jessup University of Washington built. And she compared them with um, <clears throat> measurements made by the ships uh, on, on the hull and, and with buoys. And 
she found out to everybody's surprise, including me and her, that the, the bulk temperatures, the subsurface temperatures, agreed better with the satellite data than the skin measurements. And she concluded that there were two reasons for that. One is the noise of the instruments. And Peter Minette was kind of embarrassed because he had to admit that Mary, no matter how much it costs and how big it was, still had a lot of noise in it. And the other problem, I believe, is spatial variability, which nobody could prove. So I still want to go and prove that. And if somebody give me some money, I'll go do it. So <clears throat> th this is the mice, the Mizopex experiment. Oh boy, it got cut off. This is the marginal ice zone observation and process experiment, Mizopex. And it was a large project funded by NASA. And it was an in interesting thing. Um, some, somebody at NASA found some money. I mean, not a little bit of money like $30 million. And it had to be spent that year. And so they put out an announcement. And we, we actually won one of the projects. Some of the NASA centers were angry with us because we won, but we won. So this was Jim Islanik that won that. Anyway, we, uh, this experiment took place on the north slope of Alaska. This is where all the oil exploration is. In fact, the area that we were working in was controlled by the oil companies. You had to get permission from the oil companies to go anywhere and do anything. Um, there, it was interesting. Um, <clears throat> This is where they're doing all of the oil exploration and production. I mean, there are many, many, many oil wells up here. No, that's down here. Well, that's actually in the Gulf of Alaska, so that's down here, actually. That's Prince William Sound that was in here. No, this is, this is on the other side of Alaska. This is as far north as you can go in Alaska. And, and we had two airplanes. This, this is a little small airplane from the University of Colorado that was, they were supposed to use it, but they never could get permission to fly it. So we had a fairly large aircraft from NASA Ames Research Center, which is in California, it's called the Sierra. And then we had a thing called the in situ scan eagle, and that was done by the University of Alaska with a friend of mine. Before I got there, I didn't go there until I was in Hawaii. So I didn't go there till later. I got there in, in like the end of July. They had already crashed this plane. <laughs> now this plane was supposed to carry my instrument, but they had two noses. And the one that they crashed didn't have my instrument. But we had another, we had two instruments, but now I still have two instruments. So we flew on this, and I'll show you most of that. OK. Um, <clears throat> so this is my instrument integrated into the nose of the Scan Eagle. So the Scan Eagle has its modular. You, you have payload beds, you have nose cones, and these all then attach, and that's how you make the airplane. So the airplane has a core, and then you just add these pieces. So this is the best inside of the nose cone of the Scan Eagle. So this shows you an exploded view of how it fits in there. So it can look, it looks down, and then here's the upward-looking one. And, and that's the computer. That's the little fit PC that controls it. So this is, uh, unfortunately, it's in inches. <laughs> But it shows you, you know, how big this thing is. So here it is in, in the nose. And this is now attached to the airplane. So you can see that more clearly here. This is all closed up now. And it attaches with these little tabs. You just attach it to the plane. 
And these are the controls of the plane, so they're doing their final checkout before they close it up. And, and then you just pick up the plane and you carry it. Now I have another, oh no, that's a URL that's on my other computer, so I won't be able to do it. You just put it on the catapult. It's launched by a catapult. This catapult is from compressed air. So you pump up the catapult. You put it on, you carry it out, you lay it on the catapult. And then you have to get a little starter motor. So this little starter motor is like a drill. It spins. You go out and you spin. And you start up the motor. So it's driven by a push propeller. It's a gasoline engine. It's turbocharged. And uh, it can last for a long time. These planes can fly anywhere up to 12, 15, some even 20 hours. We didn't go any longer than seven or eight hours. But they can fly for a long time. They can fly very high. We were flying very low. Um, <clears throat> we wanted to fly low to get a much higher resolution. So we were flying at about 120 meters. But they, they will go up to thousands of, of, of well, meters as well, yeah. So it's turbocharged, which is good <clears throat> because when you get up to higher elevation, then the turbo kicks in. I hope this works. Um, it, it's on the stick. So, oh, fooey. I want to do the other one first. This is a launch, and, and we invited the oil company guys to come over and watch, and so we let the oil company guy launch one day. This is the oil company guy. Oh, come on. Oh, give me the controls. Oh, don't do that. I don't want that. Oh, don't do that. Go away. Yeah, I have to speak Spanish. What's that? A, more, a mouse? Yeah, but then you have to hook in, plug in the other USB thing, right? Yeah. Well, this thing is really fussy. Oh, shoot. I don't want that. Maybe, maybe I have to do that. Oh, come on. No, don't do that. Maybe I have to have your mouse. Yeah, the, the stick. You, do you have another USB port? Yeah, okay, sure. good. Okay. Uh, it's not loading. It can't convert it, it says, yeah. Well, let's try then. But if we can't do this one, it won't be able to do the other one. I know. We will get out of this. Okay, let's go down here. And open this. And open this. And we will go down. See, one of the planes was called Big Bird. So we we um, we flew on the Big Bird. What? It's still not doing it. What do I need here? I don't understand the Spanish. What? Which one? The first one. Okay, so now will it work? Oh, good. Here it is. So he's going to go over and he's going to pull the cord. And there it goes. That's how it takes off. And it goes out. And after a few seconds, it's, you don't see it anymore. It's gone. You can hear it, though. It makes a lot of noise. So can I close that one? 
And then I want to do another one, which is where... What? Yeah, I'm going to show it to you. Don't worry. We got it back. We don't have any data if we don't get it back. So we do want it. We do want some data back, yeah. Oh, here we go. Oh, this is another. This is the scan eagle. There it goes. Following it for a while. Pretty soon it's lost. But I have one on its side. Oh, that's still the same. That's not what I wanted. Okay, here we go. So here you can see the same thing, except it's from the side. So he pulls the cord, and off it goes into the clouds. And it's gone. Very hard to see after, after it takes off. So now I want to go back to the presentation, and I'll come back to this other thing in a minute. See, what? What? You've never been to the Arctic, have you? There are no such things as clear days in the Arctic. My first trip to the Arctic was with the Germans on the Polarstern in 1987. And there was a crew from Munich with a big LIDAR. I mean, it filled a whole van from a truck. And they put it on the top. And out of 31 days, they used the LIDAR, so it has to be clear. They were able to work for eight hours out of 31 days. That's how cloudy the, the polar regions are. You, you don't find clear days. Don't look for them. They're not there. <laughs> so um, this is showing you the track. So we, we did have to pay attention to the FAA. That's the... Uh, <clears throat> The, the U.S. control system for aviation. So it's the Federal Aviation Administration. And they, these are the idiots that make up all the rules for aircraft. And they are kind of idiots. But we were flying under, under the control of these NASA people. So they told us when we were close to shore, we had to fly in a restricted corridor because there were people that were flying on small planes counting whales. So we couldn't endanger the people counting whales. But once we got out very far, we're in international waters and the FAA has no jurisdiction. So we can fly wherever we want. So we flew a pattern and this pattern is pre-programmed you put it into the, to the plane. So the plane's computer tells it where to go. It flies on GPS. It knows exactly where it is. It just goes out there and does what you tell it to do. You know, the planes are fairly stupid themselves. They just have computers and they just do what you tell it. And as long as the gas is still going and the motor is still going, they just keep going, which is really good. So here are two guys, they're controlling. We had two planes up at the same time. This was one that was a little closer into shore and they were controlling that one. And then this guy, Mike, was controlling the big bird, the plane that we were on. And, and this little thing right here, does anybody recognize that? Come here, you, come here, you video guys. You can see that, right? That's, that's like a video game controller or a radio aircraft controller, 
and they use that to check out the plane before it takes off to see that the aerolines work and the rudders work. So that's only there to check out the plane before it's launched. After it's launched, that isn't used. These are some of the local residents. So <clears throat> they were around, you know, having lunch. This is one of the big oil systems. So they're, they are collecting the oil and pumping it down to the lower states. Lots of big oil wells. And so these are, these are caribou. So these are Santa's reindeers. But these guys can't fly. We didn't see any of them fly. We were flying, they weren't flying. This is where we stayed. We stayed in this. This is a former dew line station. So when the US was really worried about Russia attacking us, we built all these things up high in, in the Arctic, big radar stations. This is a big radar station, but they're not used much anymore. So we were able to stay there. The accommodations are very Spartan. They're not very luxurious, but the food was excellent. Food was fantastic. No complaints about the food. But some days it looked like this. So if you wanted to wait for your clear day, not going to happen. The nice thing about the UAV, though, it flies generally under the clouds. So often, you know, when you're comparing, and you'll see one comparison with the satellite data, where the satellite, the cloud is blocked it, but the UAV is collecting data under the cloud. So it's another benefit. This is a drone. This is a drone. Same thing. Drones can be any kind of size. In fact, that was a really, well, it would have been funny if it hadn't been so sad. Um, when NASA funded us, we proposed using the Sierra for the NASA aircraft. NASA had a plane. It's called the Icona, but it's a predator. So when you see on the news when they shot a terrorist, that's usually a predator that's done that. The predator is this pusher aircraft with this funny big nose that can be controlled and shoot rockets and all sorts of things. Well, they had one, and we were supposed to use it. Oh, boy, we went through all these gyrations. We had meetings and... It was going to be so complicated because they couldn't fly out of an air. They could not fly out of Dead Horse, which is the closest airport. They had to fly out of Fairbanks, which is too far away, and it was going to take too long. Because it took too long, we would need an extra crew to fly the plane, and they didn't have an extra crew. And after a year and a half, they finally said, "No, this isn't going to work. Go back to the Sierra." So we went back. It was so stupid. We wasted so much time and so much money. Hmm. So it can look like this in, in the middle of August. This was the middle of August. So it can look like that. Good luck getting clear sky. So this is the other thing. If the wind wasn't blowing, and there were days when the wind wasn't blowing, the mosquitoes were so thick that if you didn't wear something like this, they would eat you alive. Now, my hands aren't covered because I can put my hands in my pockets. But notice I have long sleeves, long everything. And so the mosquitoes were really, really terrible. The bears were also bad. And we had these stupid little, we had a bear fence. But it would have done nothing, I'm convinced. But we didn't see any bears except the last couple of days. There there was a grizzly bear with its cubs, and, and they made everybody go inside. But we never saw any polar bears. Those are the ones they're really afraid of. OK, I got to get out again to play the capture video. And you go capture.
Okay. This one's going to do... Oh, no, it's going to run. Look at that. Okay. We're looking out. We're looking out. We can hear something. We know the plane's coming because we can look on the screen. We know where the plane is. Okay, so I'm trying to see the plane. I'm trying to see the plane. There's the plane. You can see the plane. But I want to zoom in so you can see the landing. This is the landing strip. It's a wire. So the plane comes in. Boom, it hangs on the wire. That's how it lands. What? Is that the same point? It, yeah, we're, we're in the same general area. So the catapult is here, and this crane with the wire is just behind. And, and the reason that this, what is this one? Can I, can I do it again? So what do I take this one? Okay. So this this system is done this way. So you could do it from a ship. You could launch from the catapult and then land on a wire. No need for a runway. You don't need a runway. You don't need a large space. So here comes the plane in, coming in, coming in, and then and it's coming in guided by GPS. So GPS tells it where it wants to go. It goes right in there on the GPS beacon, and then it hangs up on the wire. It has a little grabber on the end of either wing. It can land on either wing. And when it lands, the wire slides down the wing, and it grabs it, and it just hangs up there. And then so you can see these guys rushing out to, to grab the plane. So they have to grab the plane. The, no, the cable is vertical. Cable is vertical, and and this device that you can see, you can see it, it, it's it's a crane, but it's articulated so that it, it can can give and then bounce back, so you don't damage the plane. So the plane does a big when it hits, big momentum, and then it bounces back. So it's a very neat system. Um, unfortunately, since I had to change computers, I can't get back to, I, I downloaded um, a, uh, a YouTube video from the military. This is called a Scan Eagle. So you can go out and Google Scan Eagle, and you'll find there's a YouTube video where the guy comes out with a Scan Eagle. It's in a box. And he opens up the box, and he pulls out the scan eagle, and he puts on one wing, and he puts on the other wing, and he hooks them up, and he picks it up, and he carries it over to the catapult, and he puts it on the catapult, and he starts the motor, and he launches the thing, and then it shows him landing it. So it shows the whole process. This thing fits in a box that you could, well, you would have to check your luggage, but you can take it on an airplane. So, um, <clears throat> okay, now I want to get back to this. Okay, we played the capture video. So here is some of the first data. And um, like it says, the data from this experiment is waiting for me to stay home for a while so we can get it published. The students won't finish it unless I really get on their butts. <laughs> so they've done, done this analysis. This doesn't look very impressive. It looks kind of blocky and spready. But the thing you have to remember is each one of these spots is only one meter in size. It's only one meter. So this is a patch of ice. I, I hesitate to call it an ice flow because it's so small. But you can see the gradient of temperature. So that's telling you the direction that the current is flowing relative to the patch of ice. Or the ice is moving in, in still water. Not too sure. The, the really important thing is that these values represent absolute temperatures. 
Those are the absolute temperatures because of the black bodies. So we have calculated absolute temperatures. And the, and the really interesting thing is that they're now making microbolometers which have exactly the same format with an even higher re spatial resolution and a better sensitivity. Gondola. The, ac the, the accuracy based on those, those inner comparisons is 0 0.14. Yeah. Now the scale goes from minus 0.1. Right. Yeah, but we, we can scale it any way we like. The accuracy, like I said, is, is basically 0 0.1. But that's a lot better than anybody else because anybody else, if they showed you a plot like this, they would not be able to tell you what the temperature was. In fact, there are instruments that can show you much better pictures, but they don't have any idea what the temperature is. Most of the infrared instruments that you can buy were made to measure blast furnaces, race tires. People use infrared for measuring Race tires, I do that. So, um, but they're not made to do absolute temperature. They're made to show you gradients. They're made to show you spatial gradients. This is an absolute temperature system. So these are absolute temperatures. This is a series of, of best pictures across an ice flow, a little piece of ice. So the amazing thing, but, you know, no surprise at the edge of the ice and this other edge of the ice, except you get a lot of detail here, but there's even patterns across the ice itself, okay? And, and so with these new microbolometers, we can just substitute in for the microbolometer and the rest of the instrument stays the same. So the optics stay the same, <coughs> the calibration system stays the same. And we can have a much higher spatial resolution and a much higher sensitivity. So we would get even more accurate temperatures. And this is a comparison, again, between MODIS pixels. So each one of these little squares is a one kilometer pixel. And you can see the nearly coincident, it's not absolutely coincident, and that's why there are some real differences but these are stripes of the best. That's it. I'm done. I'd okay. love for a picture of Alaska. <laughs> so if you have any questions, don't forget to press the button. So the questions can be recorded because some of the questions you have already made, they are very interesting. So it's a pity that the people are not going to, to hear them. So you can ask again. <laughs> so Bill, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, my question would be you're measuring very fine temperature differences. Mm -hmm. it's from minus 0 0.1 Kelvin to, no, uh, yeah, minus, 0.1 to plus 0.1, and the instrument accuracy is 0.1. Right. So the differences that you're measuring are within the right. but, measurement variance. But the instrument is responsive to those. It's just if you want the absolute accuracy of the instrument, it is that. So, you know, you, you could say, you know, you only have that level of difference but the instrument does respond at those, those finer temperatures. And with a new microbolometer, it'll do even better. So, but the, the, the thing is that, you know, you, you don't see absolute temperatures anywhere else. <laughs> other, other than, I mean, you know, the Mary is supposed to do absolute temperatures but it doesn't do them very often and it doesn't do them, it can't 
I mean, the nice thing about the UAV is it can go out and fly over an area, a large area, fairly quickly, not really fast, but fairly large area, and it can do it repeatedly. And so if you had multiple UAVs, you could go out and monitor an area for, you know, 20, 30 hours. And nobody can tell me what an area of sea surface temperature like that looks like over 20, 30 hours. Never found anybody that can tell me the answer. And I'd like to know, because I'm convinced it's going to look a lot more variable than what anybody thinks. And until we get the capability of measuring those scales, you have to say, um, you know, our satellite data does not really represent what's going on down there. And yet we use satellite data for virtually every sea surface temperature. I mean, every sea surface temperature map, I've been involved in sea surface temperature basically all my career. And, and everything is based on satellite data. And it's, and it's really good. I mean, you know, it's what we have. But there's things going on at scales we have yet to measure. And that's why I want to measure these scales. And I can't do it with a satellite. If I could, I would. Yeah, Christian. And then we'll come back up here. So in a world of where we tend to do global monitoring, where do you think it's the potential of these instruments just in a way of monitoring the surface of the oceans or calibration or not just sea surface temperature, uh, but for instance, uh, altimetry? What do you think is well, the potential? Yeah. Um, I don't know of, of, well, we are actually doing altimetry and have done altimetry on this scale with a laser, with a LIDAR, not with a radar. But there are very small synthetic aperture radars. They're built by companies in Utah. They were all former students of David Long, a friend of mine. And so we could look at synthetic aperture radar. So we can get images of surface roughness from these types of measurements. Um, I'm sure if somebody put their mind to it, we could build a radar altimeter that would work at these scales. Um, we have built lasers, LIDARs, that work at these scales. So the thing is, um, we can build instruments that work on these kind of platforms. And in doing that, we can now measure at time and space scales that we couldn't do before. So that's the thing that I find. I, I put in a really big proposal <laughs> to NASA. It was $30 million. But it had all kinds of measurements from UAVs. And it had all kinds of UAVs. It had like three or four different kinds of UAVs. But it was not. They didn't fund any UAV work at all. <laughs> so, and um, even the big ones, they didn't fund the big global hacks or anything. So, I think there's a big, big potential here that we have have we've completely missed the scales that you can resolve with this. We don't know what they are. And, and now with the submesal scale, you know, the submesal scale is something I'm very interested in. It's between the mesoscale scale eddies and turbulence, but the the submesal scale is fairly short lived. So you really can't see. I mean, the wide swath altimeter SWAT. Everybody's heard of probably heard of SWAT. SWAT is the surface water ocean topography. Well, SWAT's going to have the ability to see the submissile scale, but it's only going to come back every 20 days. And the submissile scale doesn't last but hours. So you're not going to have any history of what happened. You'll see a submissile scale feature or a series of features, and when you come back, it's going to be a completely different world. It's like a whole new sample. You need to be able to sample over 
the space over the time that they're changing. And you can't do it with a satellite. Maybe from geostationary orbit, but that's up at 36,000 kilometers. We don't have instruments that work that well up there. We're doing better, but still a problem. You had a question. That was my question indeed. I mean, if you tried guys to measure another parameter or whatever. But... Oh, yeah. Yeah, we were going to do, <laughs> gosh, we, we were going to do um, ocean color. We were going to do, you know, temperature, surface temperature. We were going to do synthetic aperture radar. We were going to do LIDAR. We were going to do uh, ocean altimetry with LIDAR, with, with <coughs> light. So, yeah, we, we, we have the capability of doing a lot of other things. And these, these small synthetic aperture radars have been flown a lot by the military for doing reconnaissance because they're all weather. You don't need to worry about sky. You, you don't even need to worry about flying under the clouds because the radar will go right through the clouds. So um, there's a lot of things that can be done. And, and you know, the military is doing a lot of it, but the scientific community is kind of behind. And it's too bad because there's some big, you know, potential out there for people to do things. Yes. On the last image that you have shown us, you have compared just with the MODIS data or some other that was satellites? Modis. Because as I have seen that the MODIS data all, all the time have some white pixels because of the That's cloud. clouds, yeah. But have you tried to compare with SSMI data because this is micro radiometer, they, they, they resolution, yeah, very Okay, here's your, pro here's your problem. You're operating an instrument on a UAV with one meter resolution. SSMI is going to have tens, if not hundreds of kilometer resolution. I'm not sure that makes any sense. And there is no other um, kind of but SSMI satellites? can't do surface temperature, so you would have to use AMSER. But you could use AMSER for surface temperature. But the AMSER pixels are going to be 30 plus kilometers. So you have a 30 kilometer pixel versus a one meter one. pixel. And I'm not sure what that means. So then if you would like to compare just with the MODIS data, you need to uh, take not the Arctic, not the... Um, Equator, but the region where it's like we have less clouds. Well, I, just have to to fly, than this? I have to fly where my experiment is funded. Okay. <laughs> I can't just go wherever I want. Yes. When a non class member, look. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask it, it would show, is this the most accurate way to measure um, remotely from a fixed platform? Would you use the same type of instrument for that? Yeah, you could. And in fact, um, I'm, I've been talking with a former student in, uh, in the UK, actually, about putting it on a ferry. And I've been trying to talk with the people from Academia Morska about putting this on the Darmojeji, putting it on a big sailing vessel. Um, the advantage of this system is that it's small and it's relatively inexpensive um, and it's pretty accurate for its size. So um, we haven't got into competing with people that have been doing like Miami with these really big expensive instruments. Miami has done an excellent job of getting their huge interferometer on research vessels. They've gone all over the Pacific and the Atlantic and down to the Antarctic. And, but it's so involved. I mean, you have to get a crane to mount this thing on a ship. They've also put it on a cruise ship, but it's so expensive and involved that it, it's, a, it's a real problem. Um, I'm hoping that more people will get interested and people are starting to contact us and ask us about this thing. 
and they use it, what, what it would have cost to have another one. So it's fairly, fairly inexpensive by comparison. And, uh, but it hasn't really taken off yet. I mean, we're not making tons of them. We only have two of them. <laughs> yeah. Would it be possible to install this instrument after on usual airplanes? Because there's a lot of airplanes going back and forth in all the world. So maybe it would be possible to use this. You don't need to put, like, spent gas and oil. For it. Yeah, the biggest problem, well, you have two big problems. One is those planes fly very high. Oh, great. If you fly very high, you don't have the resolution. And getting permission to put anything on a commercial aircraft is almost impossible. Okay. And cruises? Bef before I had this instrument, I tried to put an instrument on United Airlines. It was not going to happen, not in my lifetime. So getting permission to put something on a commercial aircraft, no way. Okay. And I even knew the pilots. Anything else? So, if you don't have more questions, um, the bus is waiting for you in five minutes, so maybe it's time to finish. But if you would like to ask more questions, I can actually send someone to tell the bus driver to wait. So, it's your choice. Any more questions? I'll have to get this thing off. No? So, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, those that are part of the course and the external ones also. It's nice to have other people interested. And I would really like to thank Bill for this extra effort because actually I didn't ask you about the talk until um, <laughs> Tuesday, I, I think. So it was all a, everything was a last minute thing. So he really had to make an extra effort to prepare a talk for us. So. I you think have, we you can have to ask, thank my son because I didn't have these pictures on the computer, so I had to get him to upload them from the computer at home. Yeah, we had a, a few difficulties, <laughs> including the Mac Windows fight before, but I think everyone worked pr pretty well, and at least me, I enjoyed the talk, so thank you very much, Bill. <laughs>